Uh, I would like to invite, oh, well, to welcome you all to uh, the final in uh, this year's public seminar series here at the no uh, Norwegian Noble Institute. And today we have uh, a very interesting scholar, uh, because not all scholars planned to become academicians. Today's speaker planned by his own admittance uh, first to become a musician. Uh, he uh, has later worked in various trades, even been a journalist become, uh, before becoming one of Romania's most well-respected scholars. Professor Adrian Pop is a professor of international relations at the National University of Political Science and Public Administration, a bit of a mouthful, in Bucharesti, uh, as well as being the director of the Center for Regional and Global Studies at the Romanian Scientific uh, Society for Interdisciplinary Research. He has a PhD in history and over 20 years experience in interdisciplinary research and transinstitutional collaboration with experts from around the world. He has written numerous books, ranging from a phenomenology of Romanian historical thinking to facing the challenges of policy research through training strategists in Europe and more general coursework books such as the Romanian Introduction to International Relations. Following up on last week's talk held by Professor Lea Gronek uh, on the gas and uh, the gas relations between the EU and Russia, Professor Pop is here to address us on the theme EU, Russia and the competition over the shared neighborhood. Professor Pop, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Asle, for this generous introduction. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be with you this afternoon here. It's a real honor and privilege for me to address you in this historic building. Uh, the Nobel Institute has proved to be not only a very helpful and uh, supportive place to do research, but also a friendly one as well. And I would like to thank this to Ger, Olaf, Asle, and all the staff of the Institute who are wonderful. Um, the question I was particularly interested in is the following one. To what extent the Eastern Partnership led to a re-evaluation of Russia's relationship with the EU? I'm going to give an answer to this, but firstly, I would like to share a joke with you. In the old times, uh, we, in the communist uh, bloc, we used to uh, hear and listen to Radio Free Europe uh, about the Radio Yerevan jokes, Q&A type. One of that read as follows. Uh, Radio Yerevan was asked, uh, are zebras white animals with stripes, black stripes, or are black animals with white stripes? The answer was yes. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this joke nicely encapsulates uh, how hard it is sometimes to get grips on the very evolving, uh, continuously evolving reality and uh, which uh, has uh, different nuances and shades. Uh, with this disclaimer, let me firstly uh, sketch out what I'm going to talk about. Firstly, I am going to, to sketch the dynamics of the EU-Russia bilateral relations. Secondly, I will focus on the role of um, shared neighborhood in general and the Eastern Partnership in particular in uh, shaping the outlook of this relationship. Then I would uh, review the main theoretical approaches related to the topic in order to assess their assets and drawbacks and to suggest some ideas for further research. At the beginning of the 19th, in order to get through its tough transition and secure itself a place in the emerging post-Cold War European architecture, Russian Federation chose to develop a partnership with the European community. After a wrong negotiation process, which started in late November 1992 and coincided with a period of negotiation process, which started in late um, uh, June 1994, uh, in June 1994, a partnership and cooperation agreement was signed. Uh, based on liberal political values and an asymmetric relationship between the two actors, the PCA spelled out a relatively ambitious agenda of cooperation, similar to that of accession process. The PCA's central focus, as seen from Brussels, was the harmonization of Russian legislative framework. 
Russia's commitment for observing the political values underlining the PCA was put to test even before it's entering into force by Russia's behavior towards the first um, uh, war in Chechnya. This context, combined with the grave economic crisis experienced by Russia in 1998 and the political instability that followed, have led the European Union to adopt in June 1999 a common strategy on Russia. Underlining the idea that a stable and prosperous Russia is crucial for a Europe whole and free, without dividing lines, the common strategy was embodying the EU's vision for a desirable future evolution of EU-Russia partnership. Its replica came in October 1999, in the form of the Russian Middle Term Strategy on the development of the relationship between Russia and the EU, and Putin's Off Manifesto Russia at the Turn of the Millennium in December 1999. These two documents were later complemented by, other, by the other two, the National Security Concept adopted in January 2000 and the Foreign Policy Concept from June 2000. Against the background of the EU seeking to sanction Russia over a breach of European values in the Second War in Chechnya, these documents gave expression to Russia's dissatisfaction with the result of its cooperation with the West, its desire to be treated as an equal partner by it, and its commitment to the principle of sovereign democracy rejecting Brussels' meddling in its internal affairs. Following the logic of pragmatic national interest, rather the one of transformative interaction desired by Brussels, these Russian documents signaled a new turn in the EU-Russia relationship. This was soon to be reflected in one key area of these relations, energy security, despite an energy dialogue convened upon at the EU-Russia's Paris summit in October 2000. The Treaty on Energy Charter and Affiliated Protocol, which were meant to create a pan-European energy market according to the GATT principles, have not been ratified by Russia, despite their signing in 1994. And then they were even removed from the state Duma agenda. As Russia chose to stay aside the European neighborhood policy, considering itself too big and too important to be put in the same basket with its other European junior partners in Eastern neighborhood, but at the same time, its self-identification with Euro was rather strong. At the EU-Russia St. Petersburg Summit in May 2003, the Four Common Spaces Initiative was launched. The initiative was well received by the Russian uh, elite because theoretically, it offered Russia the prospect to be treated as an equal partner, which explains the quick signing of its initiative roadmaps at the EU-Russia Moscow Summit in May 2005. There were substantial joint interests, at least in three out of four common spaces, and progress has been made in various areas. However, on the whole, none of the four spaces work as intended by Brussels. For instance, Russia rejected the Energy Charter's treaty proposal for free access to export and transit pipelines, signaling once more a selective adoption of the acquis. As testified by the difficulties that two sides faced in 2006-2008 in even beginning the negotiation for a successor to the PCA, EU and Russia had serious problems even agreeing on a concrete joint agenda. Eventually, at the EU-Russia Rostov Summit in May-June 2010, the Partnership for Modernization was launched, originally a German concept inspired by the federal Germany's Cold War Ostpolitik. The new partnership initiative was conceived to be a step further for improving the bilateral dialogue initiated in the framework of the four common spaces. By signing in, Brussels hopes to strengthen the economic and institutional reform in Russia. Seen from Moscow, it aimed at getting both access to the European financial, industrial, and energy markets and a visa-free travel regime. In fact, in spite of the 7 million euros spent over a five-year period, the partnership for modernization hasn't delivered the outcomes expected from it. The main reason for that has to do with the different agendas pursued by EU and Russia. Whereas the EU's objective was to transform Russia according to its values and norms, Russia's objective was to selectively choose from the EU normative convergence menu only those initiatives which suited its interests and posed no threat whatsoever to Russia's state sovereignty and integrity. However, the geopolitical competition between EU and Russia over the shared neighborhood did play an important role as it will be explained in the following uh, section. The role of the geopolitical space in shaping the foreign policy action of great power is best highlighted in the periphery areas where their interests are overlaid and the interdependence and entanglement of their action and mutual perceptions are fully manifested. 
A case in point is the way the EU has been gradually drawn via the originally soft power oriented Eastern Partnership in a rather traditional hard, or hard power oriented geopolitical competition with Russia. Despite not having appetite for it uh, and being rather ill prepared to handle it. The European Neighborhood Policy Initiative was launched more than, more than 10 years ago to avoid new divisions in Europe after the EU gained 10 countries. Called by some the Big Bank enlargement, this enlargement was fundamentally uh, one which changed the geopolitical context in Europe and created the conditions for the European Union's, Union's external vocation. Um, VNP was initially meant for the Eastern European neighbors and then was extended to uh, the South Mediterranean and Caucasus areas. The hope was that over time, the initiative will bring about an area of prosperity and good neighborliness, founded on the values of the Union. Combining, in fact, elements of both the accession process and the association model, the underlying logic of the ENP rested somehow in between the access and the convergence logics. Based on this Janus phase type uh, nature, VNP had at adjusting the instrument used in the enlargement process to original cooperation post-enlargement context. Torn between the idealist vision of creating a ring of friends around the EU and the realist one of policing and surrounding them with well-governed countries, the ENP found itself trapped in a sort of inbuilt predicament. Premise on the novel but ill-defined and ambiguous idea of a special relationship between the EU and its neighbors, the EAP has tried to correct some of the drawbacks of the ENP framework, introducing a more regional focus and more differentiation among partners by the help of four thematic platform and five flagship initiatives. However, the tensions generated by a concept of partnership devoid of a membership perspective, as well as the vagueness of the concept of partnership per se, and of the relating to us of joint ownership, share values, led, to, led you to adopt a conditionally light approach uh, to, towards the neighbors. Moreover, there was a certain lack of strategic vision as well as large discrepancies in the formulation and evaluation of the ENP and EAP at the level of EU official and public discourses and a mixed response from the neighbors to its implementation with serious gaps and misconceptions between the partner countries and the EU. More than a decade after the framework document of the ENP was issued, due to a series of drawbacks, not only has ENP failed to achieve its aims, but the EU has lost considerable influence and soft power in its southern and eastern neighborhoods. Among the various factors which led to this outcome, one could cite faulty conceptual framework, eurocentric illusions, inconsistent conditionality, disengaged member states, flawed instruments, and the lack of a multi-level approach based on a variable geometry in public subsets of regional partners. What is more, with UNP, the EU aim of uh, um, aid for an approach that would go beyond traditional geopolitics. In fact, as the neighboring regions have experienced all sorts of political turmoil, traditional geopolitics has resurfaced in the forefront of the EU agenda. Moreover, the gas crisis from 2006 and 2009 underscored Europe's vulnerability, highlighting the fact that what happens in the countries from the eastern vicinity can directly affect the EU. For the Russian foreign policy, the near abroad area has always been a priority, but relations between Russia and its countries belonging to the shared neighborhood with the EU have got a new momentum when the Kremlin has started to rebalance its foreign policy, putting more emphasis on post-Soviet Eurasia. Although some sign of this shift could be detected as early as February 2007, reflected in some statement of Vladimir Putin at the Munich Security Conference, the real turn in this respect took place since 2009. Russia's self-exclusion from the EAP has gradually generated a geopolitical competitive agenda between Brussels and Kremlin, premised on, premised on a zero-sum political calculus which has heavily affected the relationship between the two actors. In an attempt to preserve its, uh, its influence over the new Eastern Europe and Caucasus, areas which it considered vital important for its own stability and security, Russia has started to promote a threefold strategy focused on hard, soft, and even normative power. As far as hard power is concerned, for instance, Moscow recognized the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, blocking George, Georgia's efforts to solve its secessionist conflicts, as well as its NATO aspirations. Uh, furthermore, using a typical um, sticks and carrots strategy in order to maintain Ukraine, 
dependent for, of Moscow, Kremlin pushed hard for the signing of the Russian Ukrainian Fleet for Gas Accord, which should have guaranteed lower prices for the Russian gas in exchange for the extension of the contract of stationing the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol Harbor till 2042. Eventually, it enacted Crimea, putting on hold one more uh, Ukraine's NATO expiration. As far as the soft power is concerned, Moscow has attempted to undermine the EAP's initiative influence with EU-like similar instruments. The Eurasian Economic Union has been conceived having in mind the EU model, with the aim to become an alternative option to the EU. On the side of the normative power, the Russian government relic has engaged itself in a battle of ideas with the EU, with the aim of promoting and legitimating its own norms and principles of political organization as alternative to the Western liberal democratic values, in the hope of winning the hearts and minds of the neighbors um, in Eastern Europe, in the new Eastern Europe. To that, if, to that effect, the media, the Russian Orthodox Church, and a whole range of institutions and NGOs, supported by a special directorate within the Russian presidential administration, have been created with a specific aim at gaining influence at both governmental and societal levels within the countries of Russia's neighborhood. An interesting and crucial part in the economy of this battle of ideas has been played by the idea, time and again emphasized by Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, that, quote unquote, no contradictions, there are no contradictions between the integration process in the West and East, East of Europe because they both come down to the free movement of goods, capital, services, and labor. Um, the presumably compatibility between the two integrative blocks was conceived as a conse consequence of uh, Russia's uh, presumed compatibility with the EU, namely that Russia is part and parcel of the European continent, culture, and civilization. Recently, Kremlin has been engaged in an integrationist race in the sphere of privilege interest. Over a five-year period, starting from the nucleus of the Eurasian Customs Union of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, which came into existence on the 1st of January 2010, and continuing with a single economic space, which was set up two years later. On the 1st of January this year, Russia has managed to put in place its little replica of the EU, the Eurasian Economic Union, which at present numbers, besides the three founding countries, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. The relative speedy pace of the Russian-led integrationist project since 2009 should be comparatively assessed against its relative prior stagnation. For instance, the agreement for creating a constant union between Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan was signed since 1995, but the project has remained on paper for nearly 15 years. Such circumstances raise the question, what has actually prompted Russia to speed up its integration moves? Our hypothesis is that the negative perception of EU's Eastern partnership by the Russian elite was a crucial factor which led Russia to adopt a rather nervous and bullying behavior in the EU-Russia shared neighborhood. This perception fed into Russia's post-imperial anxieties, anxieties related to the loss of its former strategic glasses due to NATO and EU expansion. Having a predominantly realist perception of the international system, Russia has been unable to comprehend the win-win concept originally underlying the institutionalist neoliberal approach on which the EAP was premised. Despite not offering the perspective of EU accession, the EAP has been perceived by Russian leaders as a tool for preparing the, Eastern, the EU's eastern neighbors for a possible future integration into the EU, a competitor for the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union, and even as an instrument for promoting NATO's goals in the region. The tough statements vis-a-vis -vis EU before and after the EAP's launch testify for the fact that this European initiative designed for, designed for the Eastern neighbors uh, determined Russia to dramatically change its stance vis-a-vis -vis the EU. For the first time since Soviet Union breakdown, Moscow accused the EU official of intrusion in its sphere of privilege interest anti-Russian policies and promoting the US and NATO's interest in Europe. The initiative was launched in a context of strained relations between EU and Russia in the aftermath of the Russian-Georgian war and the gas crisis in Ukraine from January 2009. Symptomatically for the prevailing Russian elites mood back then, after a deal was struck between Ukraine and EU in March 2009 to upgrade Ukraine's gas pipelines, Vladimir Putin, Prime Minister at that time, threatened to review Russia's relations with EU. Quote, unquote. If Russia's interests are ignored, we will also have to start reviewing the fundamentals of our relations, was put in warning address to Brussels. 
Moreover, at the press conference which took place in the emergence of the Russia-EU Permanent Par Partnership Council in Luxembourg in April 2009, responded to the media question, quote unquote, does Russia consider the creation of the Eastern Partnership Program as an attempt to form a new EU sphere of influence? Russia Minister Foreign Affairs Lavrov said, quote unquote, regarding the Eastern Partnership, we are hearing assurances from Brussels that this is not an attempt to create a new sphere of influence, nor a process direct against Russia. We want to believe what we are hearing from Brussels, although I won't conceal the sound comments on these initiatives that come from the EU have made me uh, cautious. In fact, VIP prompted Russia to enter in a geopolitical and geoeconomic competition with view over the new Eastern Europe. By pushing up on the bilateral agenda the question of Ukraine and EU enlargement, VAP has reopened the issue of the boundary between EU and the CIS, uh, which during the 90s seemed to fall in oblivion at the time both sides recognized each other's separate spheres of influence. What's more, immediately after the launch of VAP in November 2009, the Russian president promulgated a significant amendment to the national defense law in accordance with which Moscow is allowed to militarily intervene in other states in order to protect Russian citizens residing abroad. In fact, the Russia bilateral relation has steadily deteriorated since 2009, in spite of the setting up of the Partnership for Modernization in 2010, and the fact that the EU supported Russia's succession to the WTO in 2012. In addition, the two major actors have increasingly found themselves interwoven in a typically zug zwang situation, that is, players cannot implement their strategy, but successfully block the policies of each other. Neither the launch of the ENP nor the accession to view of the three Baltic states and the former member states of the Warsaw Treaty disturbed Russia as much as VAP. Actually, before the ESP's launch, the main Russian concern was NATO enlargement and the increasing US influence in the ex-Soviet space. In this vein, Moscow accused Washington of being behind the color of the revolution in Georgia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. Moreover, in its attempt to counterbalance the American influence in Europe, Moscow regarded itself as a um, European power and the EU as a strategic partner which could have felt have helped to counterbalance the influence that the US and NATO exercised in the international arena. The proposal of Russian President Medvedev for a new European security treaty, reiterated in various occasions in 2010, uh, excuse me, 2008-2009, fits perfectly this line of uh, reasoning. It meant establishing a pan-European security system counterbalancing the Russian perceived NATO centuries in Europe. Although the draft European security treaty received a rather cool reception in the West, in Germany it was welcomed. In fact, soon afterwards, in June 2010, Germany itself proposed a similar initiative at the bilateral meeting between Merkel and Medvedev at Messerberg Castle near Berlin. The Messerberg Memorandum proposed creating a new Russia political and security policy committee to be chaired by Catherine Ashton and Sergei Lavrov for high-level consultation and decisions on civilian and military crisis management operations and identify Transnistria as the first testing ground for the EU-Russia security cooperation potential. Despite receiving the French backing at the German-French-Russian summit in Deville in October 2010, the Messerberg initiative was not endorsed by the EU. Uh, by fear that it would offer Russia a ticket to decision making on European security. Although the geopolitical and geoeconomic aspects of the relation between the EU and Russia have been generally ignored by the four platforms of the EAP, they have been gaining increasingly more importance in bilateral relations as it eventually became painfully obvious around the Vilnius summit of the EAP. As a pivotal country in this new geopolitical and geoeconomic game, Ukraine has become a battleground between Russia and the West. The developments in Ukraine, the Euromaidan process, the annexation of Crimea, and the hybrid war launched by Russia in Eastern Europe speed up the association process of Moldova and Georgia, and in the case of Moldova, the visa liberalization process too. The Eastern Partnership Summit in Riga on the, on the 21st, 22nd of May 2015 has better clarified the principles of the future development of the EU initiative, differentiation, flexibility, compliance with the views, and mutual interest. Before the summit, the European leaders made clear certain basic points. VAP aims at deepening cooperation and not EU membership. The level of cooperation will be determined according to the parties' needs, readiness, and sovereign choice. The development of the initiative will follow a step-by-step -step process, and it's not directed against Russia. By conceiving of differentiation as a cornerstone of the future EAP strategy, the EU has in fact acknowledged that it should move at different speeds in its eastern neighborhood. 
In terms of differentiation between the six Eastern partners, the EAP summit in Riga has confirmed the overall trend of the previous summit in Vilnius. Three countries, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, seem to be more resolute about their European aspiration. Although one of them, Moldova, has lagged behind after the last elections. Uh, and um, other three, Belarus, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, seem to be more cautious about cooperating um, with you. Two of them because of their membership in the Euro Eurasian Economic Union, and the other because of the Russia's involvement in the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict. Security-wise, one particular outcome of the EAP summit in the capital city of Latvia should be noted. The EU's willingness to give opportunity to Ukraine and other partners concerned to take part in CSDP activities, missions and operations, and to deploy to this effect an advisory mission in Ukraine. Overall, VAP seems now to be geared towards a more realistic and pragmatic mode. Although its prevalent bilateral approach in dealing with Eastern partners, as opposed to a multi multilateral one, negatively affects its efficiency. Moreover, there is still risk for a U-turn in some EAP countries in terms of European values, local conflicts, combating corruption, and democratization. The EU's challenge now is to devise a two-speed strategy taking into account its concentric circle approach and its various external governance boundaries. From a bigger picture perspective, more importantly seems to me uh, the fact that a series of developments, developments testifies for the revival of a Cold War-like mentality and behavior. According to the European Leadership Network, throughout the one-year period following the annexation of Crimea, there were 66 incidents, out of which three were high-risk incidents, 13 very serious incidents, and the rest uh, near routine ones. Some of these predominantly air and naval incidents were meant to test Western reactions and to collect electronic intelligence related to Western defense systems. A growing militarization is taking place also in the EU member states, which have experienced the geopolitical consequences of the former Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1940, in general, and the, and the new EU member states in particular. This situation is even more complicated, but at least two geopolitical and strategic circumstances, which apparently have heightened Kremlin's sense of encirclement, which manifests rather periodically in Moscow's relations to the West. On the other hand, one has the two U.S. proposed and inspired free trade agreements, the TTIP between U.S. and EU, and the TPP between U.S. and a number of Asian countries, which flank Russia to the west and east. On the other hand, one has the U.S. ballistic missile defense system in East Central Europe, which is perceived by Russia as a pro-U.S. front in East Central Europe set up near its borders, and whose first phase of, it, phase of implementation will be over this year. These two rather new geopolitical and strategic circumstances together with the prolongation of the Ukrainian crisis could inevitably lead Moscow and Washington back into some sort of confrontation, negating the less remnants, if any, of, the sort of, the, of this um, uh, reset policy announced in 2009. Against this background, as well as repositioning in accordance with Asia private strategy, the U.S. is vitally interested in consolidating the pro-Western forces involved in the balance of power in Eurasia and in strengthening the links with the trans within the transatlantic alliance with the EU in general and the East European alliance neighboring Russia in particular. In a nutshell, not only the eastern borders of the EU have started to become harder than softer, as originally envisaged by the EAP initiative, and new buffers have started to be considered at state and regional levels by both sides, but at the pan-European level, against the background of the crisis in Ukraine and the risk of the suspension of gas supplies to the EU, there has been a revived discussion of the U.S. energy security along the lines of the energy union concept. A renewed sense of mission with a normative foundation based on a strong and comprehensive transatlantic partnership has been established in Brussels and other major European capitals, leaving constructivists reassured that international politics is basically a world of our making. By now, it is, should have been, by, uh, become clear at least two key points. Russia's negative perception of EAP led to a drastic re-evaluation of its relationship with the EU in the sense of changing the perception of the EU from a strategic ally to a competitor for influence in the shared neighborhood. And two, it seemed as though the EU somehow sleepwalked into the confrontation mode with Russia, for which had no particular appetite and was rather ill-prepared. If this is so, what will be the theoretical implication for future academic research devoted to the subject? This is the topic of the last and uh, the third and the last section of my presentation. <coughs> In the last decade, um, literature devoted to the subject has become extremely rich. But 
Many of these uh, monographs either display a limited theoretical framework or fundamentally diverge in their theoretical approaches, thus giving partial accounts of the state of the play of the EU-Russia relations and failing to grasp the complexity of the topic at hand. Partly, this is due to the intricate complexity of the topic. Partly, this is also to an initial ambiguity of the reality to which it boils down to, borders. Indeed, to a certain extent, particular assumptions about the role of the shared neighborhood in the Eurasia relations crystallize from the ambiguity of borders, regarded as either boundaries of exclusion, the realist view, or zones and frontiers of integration, the liberal view. The realist view assumes that borders are either barriers or springboards for expansion, and they need to be policed, secured, and defended. Central to this realist and classical geopolitics view is the assumption that borders define the areas where power and interest of two or more states overlap, thereby causing tensions and possible conflicts. The liberal view assumes that borders are increasingly interfaces of cooperation and trade between states and stresses the interdependent which diminishes the probability of conflict. Consequently, borders and border policy are understood against the images of sealed walls or zones of integration. What's more, the internal-external division in international relations has reinforced the inherent ambiguity of borders. With the risk of oversimplifying the overall picture, one can broadly distinguish five basic models of theorizing the topic at hand, which cut across several international relations uh, traditions. The first model will be the structural asymmetric model. It is a very popular and prolific one, which has basically two components. The first component of it is the normative hegemony of EU over Russia and the post-Soviet states in the near abroad. The underlying pillars of this particular vision are the normative power Europe, concept developed by Jan Manners, and the external governance framework developed by Sandal Lavenes and Felix Schimmel-Lehenink. Brussels' institutional relationship with Moscow tends to be conceived in terms of EU attempting in vain to influence and motivate modern sovereign, modern sovereign Russia to embrace its postmodern values. The Westphalian state is conceived as a benchmark against the, to measure the, the degree of incompatibility between Russia and the EU, with Russia being closer to the definition of a modern state and the EU evolving into a postmodern one. There are at least two problems with these two models. The first one refers to the fact that the increasing geopolitical concerns by the ring of instability, rather the ring of friends which currently surrounds the EU, invites serious reflection on the issue to what extent the EU has overestimated its normative, civilian, or ethical power, and perhaps it should complement its soft power tools with hard power instruments. The second one refers to the Westphalian state image in itself, which is hardly applicable to either the EU and Russia. Whereas the EU is still a state in the making, Russia has never been a nation state in the Western sense. This ambiguity has led some authors to develop a second component of this model, which sees EU and Russia as two contrasting empires. According to it, the EU is seen as a postmodern, liberal, and polycentric empire by example, a power model which projects its normative, soft, and economic power throughout its neighborhood and takes control all over peripheral actors by invitation rather than constant. And we have a, a promoter of empire of invitation in the case of US here. Um, by contrast, Russia is seen as a modern empire whose classical geopolitical concerns, informed by neo-Eurasianist ideology and based on a totally different set of values, makes it to project its hard power in the region thus contradicting the Eurasian pretense of Russia being also a liberal empire. Here, the incompatibility is between the dynamic, soft, blurred, and outward-looking frontiers of EU and Russia's own outer region frontiers conceived as defensive barrier, uh, barriers against the EU's encroachment into its near abroad. The second model will be the interdependent model, which has basically three different uh, but interconnected components. The first component is of this model is the pluralist interdependence one. In the context of the Greater Europe project promoted at times by Russia, Pemi Alto analyzed the EU-Russia EU relations through the lenses of the concept of interdependence developed by Keohan and Nye and Barry Bazan's English school. Assessing Russia's quest for international society and emphasizing its mostly pluralist view of it strongly biased towards the institution of great power management. Likewise, Richard, Richard Sakwa argued in a monograph that a new international regime could be created between Russia and EU, and the EU-Russia arrangement of institutionalized society could offer prospects for a regional-level international society. Maren Menkitsak went even further, and in a book he spoke the outlook of a greater Europe composed of two integration blocks, the European Union led by Germany and the Eurasian Economic Union led by Russia. Um, 
Although in the current geopolitical circumstances, the greater Eurovision remains far-fetched, it's a rather utopian idea, nonetheless it deserves to be further explored, at least for understanding why it has failed to materialize. The second component of the interdependent model is based on an asymmetric interdependence. As the energy dimension of the Eurasia relations is a crucial component, the interdependence theory has provided a consistent framework for analyzing it, especially correlated with the international regime theory, taking as a case study the Eurasia energy dialogue regime. However, contrary to the liberal theorist's expectation, the interdependence between Europe and uh, Russia in the energy sphere has in fact exacerbated security tension between the two sides, leading to the competitive foreign policy which have Ukraine at its epicenter. As the EU-Russia relation has started to look more like a classic security dilemma, where neither side is able to improve its own security without threatening the security of the other, the common wisdom about the specific effects of interdependence are starkly contradicted by the case of the EU-Russia energy relations. This findings underlines the fact that in cases when interdependence is focused on one area and falls short of complex interdependence, it's not only incapable to diminish tensions, but in fact is likely to exacerbate them. The third and the least developed component of the interdependent model is based on the security interdependent as underlined by the regional security complex theory. For instance, Bertin Nigren tackles the characteristics of Putin's foreign policy behavior towards the countries of the CIS through the lens of this theory, stressing the Kremlin, um, that Kremlin can achieve the status of greater Russia by transforming the CIS into a security community. However, this explanatory, um, potential of, uh, explanatory potential of this theory is far from being fully exploited. A third model would be the realist geopolitical model. It is informed by realism and posits that as Russia has been gaining strength economically and politically, it has become more confident and active in pursuing its national interests and geopolitical goals. Marginalized as an exploratory framework in the first decade or so after the dissolution of Soviet Union, it came back as a, against the increasing power, self-confidence, and assertiveness of Russia and its near abroad. Lately, as the actual policy at play have increasingly become of a zero-sum nature, it has led to explanation of the Ukrainian crisis in terms of the security dilemma. However, the realist framework seems better at displaying the current state of play of the Eurasia relation than the evolution which led to it. Its perspective of change is limited to fluctuations of available power capabilities, leaving little room for foreign policy patterns as shaped by consideration others than power, such as ideas or cultural beliefs. Here is where the fourth model, the constructivist one, has something promising to say. Focusing on particular social contexts and meanings, constructivists have been able to frame conflict as a process of discursively communicating positions, underlying the process by the help of which international influences by significant other creates the meaningful context in which the national self evolves and then shapes foreign policy. Relying on social constructivism, for instance, Andrei Tsiganov was able to better explain change and continuity in Russia's foreign policy. However, he treated the West as an undifferentiated significant other, whereas for a more nuanced understanding of the Eurasian conflict, uh, one should have a distinct, as distinct points of reference the various EU member states, the US, and NATO. From this perspective, further research on the topic at hand is well advised to rely more on the use of discourse analysis methodology. Um, Taking a constructivist position, one could say that by the help of intersubjective perception and speech acts, a new mutually constituted social reality based on a mutual perception, a strategic competitor rather than strategic partners, and which recalls the suspicion and hostility of the bygone Caldorira, has gradually enthroned itself in the EU-Russia bilateral relationship. Moreover, along the same line of constructivist reasoning, which posits that the self is a continuously defined a redefined relation with the other, and that subject to change, one could claim that the periphery of the external environment in which EU operates and EU and, uh, and EU interacts with Russia will continue, will continue to help shape the identity and external mission of the European Union. The fifth model is what I would call the multi-perspective model. It's a model which reconciles rather opposite theoretical paradigms and fills the gap of each other's drawbacks. Illustrative for the implementation of this model is the foreign policy analysis area, um, where the diversionary conflict theory was developed. This theory explains Russia's foreign policy stance in relation to changes in its domestic policies and posits that international conflicts can be launched by incumbents to divert public attention from domestic issues, as illustrated, for instance, by the Russian-Georgian war. 
Thus, a liberal outlook of this theory complements the traditional realist geopolitical explanation. Even more representative for the implementation of this model is Christian Torun's book on the role of ideas in explaining change in Russian foreign policy. Forum managed to address the weaknesses of the realism with the social constructivist one centered on collective idea ideas as drivers of change in Russian foreign policy. Viotor put forward a compelling argument regarding the different phases of the Russian foreign policy thinking from 1992 to 2007. Building on his argument, our contention would be that starting 2007, the geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geostrategic strengths of the Russian leadership's foreign policy thinking merged into a more cohesive role whole, which partly explains the increased toughness of Russian's foreign policy in its near abroad. From a broader theoretical international relation perspective, this study proves that realism and a thin version of social constructivism can successfully, successfully be combined. And in fact, they do complement each other rather well. However, to date, perhaps the most comprehensive theoretical framework remains the one proposed by Hiski Haukala. In the tradition of institutionalism, he has suggested that the most fruitful way of understanding the EU-Russia relationship is to view it as a post-sovereign international institution. Haukala has contended that the increasingly low degree of commonality in the EU-Russia relationship has left ample scope for divergent views concerning the appropriate logic of interaction between the two parties. By adopting the notion of contextual rationality, Haukala has in fact built a bridge between institutionalist and constructivist accounts of international relations. Moreover, he has situated the Russia interaction against the background or Russia's quest for international society in the tradition of the English school. Thus, Haukala has underlined both the possibilities and limits of theoretical complementarity and bridge building between rational and constructivist paradigms of international relations theorizing. Recognizing the positive uh, example mentioned, I would argue that such a multi perspectival theoretical framework could be enriched, complemented, and informed by other theoretical approaches too. A case in point is, for instance, a critical geopolitics approach. In accordance with it, Russian geopolitical thought has as much to do with Russia's relation with the West as it has with any typical Russian identity or interest. Although Russians work with hegemonic geopolitical concepts from the West, they do not simply apply them, but adapt and appropriate them for their own purposes. Thus, Western geopolitical discourses are not only constitutive of Russian geopolitical discourses, but also are also, in part, constituted by these discourses. Another possible example is the linkage and leverage theory proposed by Stephen Levitsky and Lucan Way. The two scholars posited two mechanisms uh, which raise the cost of authoritarianism. authoritarianism. Western leverage, defined as a country's vulnerability to Western external pressure, and leakage to the West, defined as the density of a country's ties to the West. Levitsky and Way had con concentrated on democratization and had not applied the framework to conflicts. Non-Western influence remained by and large outside their analysis, although they did consider the category of black knights. Further research might take non-Western influences, particularly Russian ones, more seriously, and might attempt also to extend the linkage and leverage theory to the relevant actors involved in open and frozen conflicts and conflict resolution in the shared neighborhood. Such a research agenda would correlate nicely with recent attempts to reevaluate Russia's present-day influence based on a correlation of the so-called hard diplomacy and soft coercion. That is, influence that is indirectly coercive, resting on cover methods which is very difficult to define that it's hard or soft. It would correlate also well with the notion of structural power, weakness power, as well as the distinction be between power as control over resources and power as control over outcomes. And I would sum up some conclusions now. Um, to sum up, the negative Russian perception of the EAP's intentions in New Eastern Europe have triggered not only EU-like integration efforts on the part of Russia, but growing tensions and mutual suspicions in the EU-Russia relations as well. In the evolution of the bilateral relation, the EU-Russia shared neighborhood played an important role. As Ukraine has become a battleground between Russia and the West in this geopolitical and geoeconomic geo game, the EU in general and the member states close to Russia in particular, have tried to address the new situation by prevalent hard power instruments. In order to make sense of the complexity and intricacies of the EU-Russia relations, one should adopt a multi-perspectival theoretical framework which look for commonalities and complementarity between different strands of theorizing. By adopting a pluralist theoretical framework informed by multi-causal social mechanism, one could more accurately comprehend the various facets of the ongoing EU-Russia conflict over the shared neighborhood and recognize the EU and Russia as dynamic and flexible subjects that deploy various integrationist and sovereign responses and impulses. Thank you.
first question today is from Professor David Ekblad uh, from Tufts University. Thank you, Adrian, for, a, for an interesting talk and an interesting way of, of, of thinking about this, this complicated, this complicated, complicated um, relationship that evolves over time. I was trying to think historically, being a historian, and think about when you, when you put this in terms of the EU and Russia and how to understand how these two sides act internally, what's motivating them, and also how they act vis-a-vis um, -vis each other. Um, where can we go historically? Because there, uh, the EU is, is a very interesting contraption, right, historically. Um, it's a departure from other, um, other eras of interstate relations, perhaps. I was trying to think during your talk of, of comparative examples where we could go to look for similar types of interchange for a, um, from a conglomeration of nation states acting in unison versus essentially one nation state or imperial actor? Um, could you summarize a little bit <laughs> shorter? <laughs> history. Um, where, where are the parallels of, of where we can also look, not just for IR, but historically the parallels to understanding um, the interactions of this design? Okay. Well, there is this very interesting book of Jan Zielonka, EU as an Empire. And he has um, made the point that, uh, you know, EU after the last wave of enlargement looks more like a neo-medieval sort of empire, uh, resembling uh, uh, the uh, post-Carolingian uh, empire in the Middle Ages. And um, or this is a very controversial uh, statement, of course, and uh, it's very difficult actually to prove this. But uh, still, it's uh, interesting as a uh, you know academic uh, exercise, and you you put this forward. What could uh, parallel could be uh, uh, be done from of the video? Well, um, in terms of um, EU, we have this uh, this uh, proposal. I, I'm not sure if uh, there are some historical parallels, uh, you know, uh, EU-Russia uh, um, relations in terms of uh, uh, conflict except of Cold War uh, type, um, which are obvious and, uh, of course, uh, uh, everybody knows about them. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, parallels in terms, at least, with um, uh, German specific, specific position in, in this uh, kind of relationship. This kind of Ostpolitik, which uh, was tried in by, by uh, Federal Germany in the Cold War, somehow res resurfaced in this new context. Of course, it, it didn't work out and uh, wasn't uh, well uh, received by other members of you, but it's still it's an interesting parallel, you know, between uh, the, this kind of interaction, which resembles, in a way, uh, to uh, Germans' uh, old Ostpolitik. Then one question from uh, Professor Leglonek. Thank you. Um, is this okay? Yes. Um, I would like to make. Um, uh, to make one comment to raise a question, one and or oh, both are questions. Uh, one is the question, the the, the the importance of the nature of government in Russia, and uh, you have mentioned it um, in relation, in particular, with the um, um, 2008 Georgia Russia war, the relation between Putin and Medvedev, etc. A number of Russian scholars in particular have stressed, in particular those who are opening the, uh, the, gov the government are stressing, the, and other uh, scholars abroad, non-Russian, have been stressing the importance of, um, of abroad as a, uh, uh, a concept, the concept of enemy, which is necessary to support a the government in power in, 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 in Moscow. To what extent is this 
important to you? In which of the five paradigms would it fit? Uh, if it does fit uh, somewhere here, would it should be this added? Uh, I don't know. I would like to to hear more about about this. I mean, the link between internal and external, uh, uh, and the nature, because you have dwelt upon the nature of the EU uh, in many ways, but maybe not the nature of power in, in Russia. The, the, the second rem or question or remark, rather, main point is uh, listening to you uh, in, during this conference, which is indeed very rich and the analysis of the various paradigms is very, very interesting. I mean, can lead us forward. But I was missing, uh, I didn't know exactly where uh, the, the countries of the neighborhood are in terms of subjects of international relations because we hear them, we hear about them being a ground for competition, but they do play a role too. Uh, and you, you've mentioned it, uh, um, but I would like to hear more because I, actually, I mean, Ukraine or the Ukrainian government and, and a part of the population wanted to join the um, DCFTA and the association agreement with the European Union and didn't, were not that interested even with Yanukovych as a supporter, so-called supporter of um, uh, Russia were not that interested in joining the um, uh, Euro Euro Eurasian Union. So how, how does that fit in, 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 in the model, EU-Russia relations and the notion of sovereign countries being able to orientate themselves? So how does this impact on the analysis that is, you have made? Uh, <clears throat> the nature of power in Russia. Um, I was uh, referring um, in my presentation to this uh, theory of uh, diversionary conflict, uh, which uh, actually points to the fact that at times, in order to divert public attention from domestic politics and uh, to raise the foreign policy profile, some incumbents of power uh, launch conflicts. And uh, this uh, was uh, somehow illustrated by the uh, Russian Georgian War of August 2008, when was this transfer, uh, transfer of power between uh, Medvedev and Putin. And Putin somehow uh, felt himself sidelined. Uh, side and um, he was a very heavy proponent of this uh, intervention. And Actually, because of this uh, war, his uh, warrior profile uh, started to build uh, gradually. Um, so this uh, it's uh, related to, I think it's an important uh, point related to uh, the question of the nature of power. Um, this concept of enemy actually plays an important role in this interplay between domestic politics and international politics. And uh, I think, yes, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, issue to, to relate to them. Of course, it would be, uh, it would fit basically in the fifth model, actually the multi-perspectival model, I, I, would, I call it, it's not <laughs> anybody's <laughs> uh, uh, brand. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, there because uh, it um, it plays on the uh, this interaction between domestic politics and foreign policy, and uh, also it connects you know the standard realist geopolitical model with the uh, uh, liberal one, which puts an emphasis on domestic policies. So uh, this, I think, it would be uh, the place to to put this uh, this uh, focus on. Uh, uh, the nature of power in it. Uh, the second uh, question, where the countries of the EAP uh, are in this um, uh, overall picture? Yes, they have a very important uh, role, and I, it's, it's true, they're sovereign countries, they are uh, entitled to choose. Uh, I wasn't uh, uh, trying to minimize their sovereign choice. Uh, of course, 
maybe it, it could look like that because I put an emphasis for you in Russia. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, their choice was important, and because of their choice, actually, some of the events, uh, you know, uh, were were developing as they did. And the trigger, of course, was a sovereign choice <laughs> at the end of the in Ukraine. So obviously, uh, these countries play a very important role, and they are subjects of this uh, drama, actually, which is happening uh, in in uh, the U.S. neighborhood. Uh, I, if, I'm sorry if it looked like that, I'm ignoring them. It, not, it wasn't my intention. <laughs> I just <laughs> uh, wanted to, to, to uh, you know, emphasize uh, this uh, interplay. Um, yes. Uh, then a question from uh, Julia Williamson from NUPI. Thank you, and thank you for a <clears throat> very good talking uh, and uh, summing up for us that entire history. I have, uh, uh, I think, three short questions. First one uh, concerns precisely the issue of these smaller but sovereign states. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just briefly comment on what your impressions are of how um, Russia's dealing with Ukraine has affected the countries which Russia hope become part of the Eurasian Union be it either Belarus or Kazakhstan, my kind of hunch is that the actions have um, caused kind of uh, an urge to pull away from the Eurasian Union, which Russia wants to have these countries in. So that's the first question. And then secondly, I was interested, could you just comment, <clears throat> although um, I would agree that Russian discourses of the West or the US or, and the EU are much more different than we often perceive of. I have a feeling that at some point uh, Russia started to look upon uh, EU to, um, to a larger extent just as an extension of the US or as the kind of big bad West. And when did that change happen in, in the history which you have and then finally, a kind of academic question. Your five um, models, uh, they build on very different um, epistemological foundations. So is your idea that you want to combine all of these? My kind of comment would be, isn't that uh, quite difficult because they build on very different uh, epistemological foundations? Or are you simply wanting to use them as different frames or perspectives to understand this relation. Thank you. Um, the first question, if I understood it correctly, um, what was the uh, outcome of uh, Ukraine refusing to uh, join uh, I see. Okay. Yes, I think I think uh, this plays the role, uh, a very important role, um, because this is perceived. Of course, it it's actually was a breach of international law, and um, uh, it was uh, uh, you know a litmus test of uh, how how Russia was perceived in terms of um, uh, benevolent or non-benevolent uh, bigger power. Uh, so I think yes, you are right. Uh, it, it played an important role um, uh, in this, um, and um, of course, uh, Ukraine uh, is being uh, very importantly strategically uh, and one of the biggest uh, uh, partners in, in the region. Uh, the smaller countries thought they have even. Um, smaller chances to be safe <laughs> in this uh, regard. Um, but um, the second one, when um, the perception, uh, you know, EU as apart from, somehow apart from uh, the US and uh, NATO uh, was 
uh, did, uh, did take place. I, mean, I, I try to, to emphasize that uh, this moment uh, is to be ascribed to 2009, when actually the Eastern Partnership was launched. Uh, uh, this this uh, you know, distorted perception of Russia that uh, somehow uh, EU is starting to promote not only its interests, but US and NATO interests in the region actually uh, was instrumental in changing their uh, their relationship and uh, to led to this uh, reevaluation of uh, Russia's uh, relations with the EU. I think this is a moment when uh, actually um, was uh, th this change uh, take place took place. Uh, it's not to be forget that 2009, when the EAP was launched, it was just after the Russian-Georgian war, and this was somehow perceived as a continuation of this proxy war <laughs> which took place in 2008 by promoting with a more, uh, more uh, uh, you know, uh, benevolent uh, um, uh, tools. Um, okay, um, the third uh, question was about uh, the different epistemological foundation of these uh, four, well, five, five, five uh, models. Yes, um, I, I wasn't trying um, nothing else that to uh, sort of uh, synthesize sort of phenomenology of the theorizing devoted to the subject and uh, try to uh, see what are the commonalities and the assets and drawbacks of each uh, strand of theorizing. Uh, and I was arguing that it is possible to actually combine, because there are already some good example of that, and I, I mentioned them, but still them are not integrating all the facets, and I was arguing that it is possible actually to combine uh, liberalism, realism, constructivism, and institutionalism uh, taking thin versions of, of constructivism and institutionalism uh, into, uh, into consideration. So this was done, this is possible, and I was arguing that we could even enrich this with uh, some, some uh, new uh, theoretical perspectives, the linkage and um, leverage theory, or a more emphasis put on discourse analysis which would nuance uh, the undifferentiated West position towards uh, Russia, which is not uh, actually the case. So uh, this was the only uh, argument I was putting forward. Yeah. Thank you. come to the point where we are now. And my question is, what uh, prospect uh, do you see for bettering these relations? And what would you, in your expert opinion, deem to be um, effective measures, especially on behalf of the West, to get out of what you call uh, a Cold War-like uh, pa pattern of interaction? Thank you. Uh, this is a tough question because I'm not a politician, <laughs> and uh, I'm not uh, having a, you know um, ready ready-made solutions that politicians always always have you know for uh, situations. Uh, I'm just a researcher studying the phenomenon and trying to get grips of it. But I would say that um, uh, this dual track policy, which actually was uh, experimented by VU in the case of uh, Ukraine crisis, uh, it's a rather clever one, uh, you know, and uh, could be, uh, could be uh, further on. But I think somehow uh, one should forget about Ukraine getting into NATO. This is uh, crucial for Russia. They want, uh, uh, they want um, 
uh, accept it for because Ukraine it's it's strategically their security belt. It's their glitches. It always has been. So I think this is, should be uh, taken into consideration and continue putting pressure on Russia on this dual, dual track policy. I think would work. Yeah. Well, then we know what to do. A uh, question from Gerd Lundestad, uh, Professor of History. My goodness. Uh, yes, Adrian, this was a very interesting presentation. You tried to cover a lot of territory. Um, I thought what was missing was maybe a clearer mission statement on your part, what you actually intended to, to show. I mean, you covered various theories, uh, many interesting developments, but I was not entirely certain uh, what your specific uh, perspective was. So I think you, uh, yeah, you, you should, in a way, have come forward uh, a bit more uh, clearly. My question uh, is about Russia. I think we are very confused about Russia. Is Russia a strong power or a weak power? There are, uh, there are arguments on both sides. And we have these famous quotations. We had Helmut Schmidt from the 90s, Russia is upper Volta with nuclear weapons. And we had John McCain, uh, Russia is a gas station camouflaging as a country. I mean, these two, these are the extremes in playing down Russia. Uh, I wonder if now we are playing up Russia. And, and my question is really, where do you see Russia? I mean, will, is Russia a truly significant power? What, what is its role? Uh, I mean, there are good arguments on both sides. Clearly, it has very important military resources. Although it's defense spending, if you look at the official numbers, they are relatively small still, but there might be a time lag there, but they're not spending so much. Economic growth, well, uh, it had good periods until 2008, but if you look at Russian exports, it's oil, gas, and weapons. And of course, this is not a bright future. I mean, there's been very little transformation in the Russian economy. They haven't solved the difficult question. I mean, uh, and the, 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 the social questions, I mean, the collapse in life expectancy in Russia, I mean, from poor men, from the low 70s down to uh, 58, 59 years, I mean, it clearly indicates a deep, deep crisis. And although these numbers have increased a little bit, they're still very low. So I'm very confused, and I hope you can enlighten me. Um, should we really see Russia as a strong power? Or should we see it as a uh, relatively weak power? Or maybe it's a combination. Uh, there are certain uh, sectors and area, but if you want to be a truly um, important player in the long run, uh, you need to be s uh, strong on more than one dimension, the military. I mean, that's why in the end, we know what happened to the Soviet Union. So where do you see Russia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Gerd. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, question, uh, Gerd style. And um, I would say, yes, it's a combination of strong and weak power. And um, uh, it's, uh, some are, sometime it's strong because it's weak. And uh, time and again, Russia uh, managed to uh, present itself like a uh, weak power after the dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union, needing help. Uh, they, they were blackmailing the West with the idea as if they don't aid us, uh, you know, some authoritarianism, populism uh, will, will come again. Uh, so th this is a, the weakness power I was thinking about uh, in my in my presentation, and it's it's a real uh, it's a real power of, of Russia, which was played time and again by it. So I would say it's a combination of strong and weak power in terms of available capabilities. You were uh, pointing, of course, uh, Russia is relying on uh, on this rather um, very limited. Uh, um, kind of resources which are now, uh, you know, uh, 
object of sanctions, and uh, you know there is this uh, drop in the prices of oil, is an economic crisis which is starting to uh, uh, started to build in, in Russia, and of course over the uh, medium uh, and long term, of course, uh, time. Um, should be a problem for, for, for Russia, but um, I would uh, I didn't uh, refer uh, Russia as a power um, to be reckoned to uh, in terms of a great power, but as it is, as it actually uh, manifests itself in, in in this crisis. So. Uh, I would say that it's a combination of strong and weak power, and uh, it managed to uh, to extract, because of that, concession from the West. Yes. Then we have one more question from the from the University of Oslo. So, please introduce yourself so we get the title right. Uh, well, my name is Paul Kolsi, University of Oslo. Is this on? Uh, I was intrigued by your last comment on uh, uh, the, you mentioned that Russia in the 90s was blackmailing the West, or trying to blackmail by saying that uh, if you don't help us, we, they will become an authoritarian leader. Couldn't we say that that's exactly what happened? Uh, there was no, uh, or very little help uh, forthcoming, and we got an authoritarian leader in the end, by Putin after, after 2000. So. Uh, <laughs> It, when you say blackmail, it sounds like it's, it's a bluff, but it's, you can see that this is the scenario was, which was played out. Uh, <clears throat> yes, you are right. At the end of the day, uh, we got what we, <laughs> we uh, loved. Uh, and, um, but I was referring to these uh, examples as an example of extracting concessions in, in the past. In the past. And, uh, uh, of course, now it's not anymore the case because Russia can't play anymore this card. It's totally out of uh, discussion. But uh, I, I was referring uh, about uh, its behavior uh, throughout the 90s and uh, partially uh, during the uh, 2000s. Uh, no, it's an obsolete card to be played, of course, by, by Russia. It doesn't work. And yes, we have, we have a, this authoritarian uh, bullying regime in, in, uh, in Moscow. Yes, it's a, it's a reality, yeah. And then a question here at the back. Madam? Yeah, thank you. My name is Ton Rand. Thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, taking the title of your presentation into account, you have naturally focused on uh, the EU, but I would highly appreciate it if you would elaborate a bit on the relationship and the interaction between the EU and NATO. Uh, and in connection with the Ukraine crisis, we have seen a certain division of tasks between the EU and NATO, uh, the EU focusing on economic sanctions uh, and NATO on the reassurance um, uh, and deterrence. How do you foresee the future if you should look into the crystal ball? How do you think that this interconnection and the dynamics will uh, develop in the future? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, <clears throat> Russia uh, tried uh, time and again to uh, somehow um, is still a verge between EU and NATO, uh, in the hope that uh, you know that could be some uh, sort of uh, disconnectedness between the two, and at a certain point in time it managed to do it. But this is of course not the case anymore. Uh, paradoxically, um, the, uh, the Russian stance uh, provided of of a new. Um, cohesiveness of the West. It, it, uh, uh, it led to a new, uh, somehow, normative mission of the West, which started to be floundering before the crisis. And it, it, it acted like a, a you know, link to strengthen the transatlantic alliance. This is a fact. And uh, it's 
if I would look on a crystal ball, I would say that uh, EU-NATO relations we will strengthen out of this crisis, and uh, maybe a sort of uh, more um, strong uh, uh, partnership, even on a global scale, could be envisaged out of it. Thank you. Uh, then a question from Pani Lerike, and you will get the law. Okay, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, you said a lot about uh, EU-Russia relations and how we can understand that and, and through these different perspectives. But I wonder if you could say a little bit on how to understand the EU as a security actor, especially the EU as a changing security actor. I mean, the neighborhood policy has been kind of the, uh, the prolonga prolongation of the enlargement process. It has been an important security policy for the European Union, and now it seems to change that the EU actually is changing completely its approach or actually that is what they are discussing now in Brussels and what what you see is coming and how will this crisis you in your view change the EU as a security actor thank you yes this is a very important uh, question um, uh, I think um, the Ukrainian crisis uh, played also an important role in strengthening the CSDP uh, and the external security vocation of the EU. Uh, and this is uh, signaled by the you know, last decision in the uh, Riga summit, uh, in order to, uh, which says that uh, in order to strengthen the relationship, the security relationship with Ukraine, uh, an advisory mission will be uh, sent there. And uh, there is an open door for uh, involving uh, Ukraine and other interested partners in CSDP activities, which is a rather a new development. It wasn't uh, up till now. And uh, this uh, will strengthen the external uh, the dimension of uh, uh, CSDP and uh, EU's, uh, EU as a security actor. Uh, I think. Uh, this will, will uh, um, have an important um, role in um, uh, changing the, the outlook of uh, EU security and defense policy. Uh, and uh, yes, I, it's, it's, I think it's an important uh, uh, development. As you know, uh, the security aspects were very limited in the EAP. And, uh, there was not put a heavy focus on, on security aspects. But uh, now with uh, the changing situation, the security is becoming more important and it's introduced officially in the uh, European neighborhood policy and uh, also in the CSDP external dimension. Thank you. Well, it would only be befitting that the final question in this year's seminar series will go to the director of the Norwegian Noble Institute, Olav Nørstad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. A uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to follow up on uh, one of the three remarks made by uh, Julia Willemsen uh, on your five perspectives. Uh, I'm sympathetic to your approach. I mean, that's the privilege of historians, we like to think that we can choose from this toolbox, whatever we find appropriate. Uh, but sooner or later, we will have to make some priority between the different perspectives or different factors in order to be able to explain something. Uh, so my question to you is, between these different perspectives, which one will you think at the end of the day will help us the most to understand Russian policy towards the near neighborhood. Uh, and, and the next question is related to information or disinformation. Uh, yesterday I was attending a ceremony here in this very room uh, where a Norbe Norwegian institution uh, awarded uh, what they call the uh, Freedom of Press Award for Russia and the Eastern Europe uh, annual prize, and it went to two journalists from Russia, two from Ukraine, one from Georgia. And all or many of these uh, laureates uh, stressed that 
perhaps the main challenge for them now is the use of disinformation. I mean, to, to, to differentiate between what is real information, what is actually uh, disinformation. And that especially Russia, but also other parties, is very professional, very active, very offensive in using disinformation campaigns uh, in the battle for truth, in the battle for, for defining uh, the situation. So my question to you, and, and this is seen very clearly related to, to, uh, to the Ukrainian situation. So my question is, do you see something else, some, something similar happening in the other countries in the near neighborhood that mm -hmm. especially Russia is on the offensive mm -hmm. uh, using disinformation campaigns in order to influence both the population and the authorities in these countries? Thank you for these questions. Uh, the first one, what model would uh, be more helpful to understand the current situation? I would reply that it depends on the point in time you are referring to. If you are referring to uh, the situation which led to the current situation, I think the constructivist approach uh, combined with, uh, you know, to a certain extent, geopolitical and liberal approach uh, would be uh, helpful. Uh, if you're referring to the current situation, obviously the geopolitical uh, realist one would be uh, more, uh, more uh, important, and uh, this is obviously so. And uh, there are recent uh, attempts to explain this in terms of security dilemma as well. But I think it's important to what period of time you're referring to, what have you in mind? I mean, uh, one is the uh, road to, one is the current situation, and it's, it's, it uh, makes a difference, yes. Uh, that's why I, I was, uh, was uh, pleading for this multi-perspectival approach, because it allows us to explain all the phases, when it started up till now, and you would apply in different points of uh, time, different approaches which fit the most this particular situation. This would be uh, my answer. The second other, uh, if you, if, if I see some uh, similar disinformation campaigns in uh, other countries, perhaps in my country or in other countries from Eastern Europe, yes, th there are some attempts, and uh, uh, there are obviously um, uh, multiplied. Uh, uh, attempts on the part of Russia today, for instance, to be more uh, present in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in our homes and uh, to present biased information. Uh, but again, it's a media outlet, and each and every media outlet uh, practices this. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it depends, uh, you know, each media outlet practices. It was not. Uh, uh, Russia is doing that. So uh, yes, there are attempts uh, and they are visible already of disinformation and I think this would uh, uh, strengthen because we are in a battle of ideas now. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we are in a battle of ideas. Thank you very much for attending and please join me in a warm round of applause for Professor Adrian Popp. This concludes our annual seminar series. I would like to thank you all for those of you who are attending in person, but also those who attend uh, via the internet. And uh, hope that you will join us next year when we will have a brand new seminar series, that time centered on the causes of peace. Thank you very much.